A very warm welcome to everyone. I'd just like to uh, echo what Marianne has just said and, and thank you for inviting me. I am chairing this, but I've also been invited to speak. Uh, and I knew that Jamal and Marianne were very clever, but I hadn't realized that they could organize the weather quite as well as this, so I'm, I am well impressed. Um, you will see from the schedule for this afternoon that you have two very stimulating uh, talks, lectures to open up the three-day event. And um, I'll start by um, inviting our first speaker uh, in a moment, uh, Professor Fiona Kumari Campbell, who I've only just met myself for the first time, so it is it's lovely to meet you, Fiona, having read your work. Fiona is Associate Professor and Deputy Head of School uh, at the Griffith Law School in Australia, so she's made a heck of a journey to be here. Fiona has had, as you may know, a long-standing interest in the civil rights of people from marginal backgrounds and the consequences of discrimination and social oppression. She is a scholar of disability studies and legal theory and is noted for the breadth of her published cross-disciplinary research. I'm just checking that I'm, you can keep up with me, by the way. Fiona has written on issues related to disability, philosophy, law, Buddhism, and technology, as well as marginality, sexuality, and race. And after the successful publication of her book, Contours of Ableism, which I'm sure you've read, published in 2009, she is working on two further books, The Unveiling of Disability, Essays on Silence, Voice, and Imprints and Cripping the Law, Jurisprudential Narratives of Impairment and Reasonableness. <laughs> Do you want me to say that again? <laughs> it, jurisprudential, it's a very difficult word. Um, voice and imprints and cripping the law. Jurisprudential, legal, legal. narratives <laughs> of impairment and reasonableness. From 2003 until the end of 2010, Fiona was the convener of Australasia's largest postgraduate disability studies program in the School of Human Services and Social Work at Griffith's Logan campus. And in 2011, she joined the Griffith Law School. Fiona has 16 years teaching experience in sociological and legal theory, human rights, diversity studies, politics, particularly in Australia, and of course disability studies, not just at Griffith University, but also at Victoria and Queensland University of Technology. We're sort of doing a tour of Australia here. Active, she's actively involved in a number of journals, including the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, which is based in Liverpool in the UK, Ethnographica, the International Review of Disability Studies, and is associate editor of the Journal of Social Inclusion. And her research interests extend to intolerance, abjection, capacity building, and leadership. I could go on and on and on, but I think you get the message that this is an extremely accomplished individual. And if I read more, I'm going to steal her thunder. So a very warm welcome to Fiona. Fiona. Just wait for that to turn on and say it's, it's absolutely wonderful to be here and um, I've just come from our winter and it's uh, it's really really hot here <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to be here and it's really great to be at uh, my first conference that's specifically looking at the theme of ableism and racism and I think that's a, a good sign of the times I've reviewed um, literature over the last decade and seen certainly ableism um, and racism and the conversations between the two is, um, is catching. But uh, look, thank you again. Um, I should warn you that uh, this is a long haul of a paper and it's a fairly dense paper. It's divided into two parts. Uh, uh, the first part is densely theoretical. Um, there's always dangers in um, 
uh, presenting theoretical material to an unknown audience. Um, I must say there's dangers even presenting it to myself because I'll often read it and think, did I write that? What does that mean? <laughs> so, um, but um, the good news is that there, there will be a PowerPoint available from the conference organisers and a draft paper. Um, I was saying to the organisers earlier that uh, some of the theoretical work around ableism, um, whilst I've been working on it for several years, has, um, is, is, uh, the second part of it is in the process of being developed and I've had worked on it specifically for this conference, so there'll be some um, extensions in this area. And I think uh, that's because this conference obviously is interested in conceptual frameworks and, and methodology, so um, uh, it was a useful opportunity to present this. So bear with me, um, I'm, obviously there are some um, some heavy, um, long, drawn-out words. You have to deal with my Australian accent as well, <laughs> and obviously issues around English. Um, so we'll just see how we go. And um, I said I'm dividing the paper in two parts. I've got um, Naluka Gunawardena here next to me helping with the timing. Um, so let's go through. So the first thing, um, so we'll just go next. So, um, so this keynote really uh, is bringing together uh, over a decade of work in developing the concept of ableism. Um, and its theoretical application, but also what we mean by the word ableism. I mean, it's being used in all sorts of ways. Um, and I guess if you did a Google search, it would probably pop up fairly regularly. But I think um, um, sometimes I think it's, it, it, it runs the risk of being used in a very jingoistic way, like you know, like racism or, or sexism, without people thinking about what it means. Um, my work draws upon a range of um, uh, theoretical approaches, and um, I like with all of us, the knowledge doesn't drop from the sky. We um, we read and sift through material, and um, uh, actor network theory, some of you may be familiar with that, the work of John Laws and Bruno Latour, um, Martin Heidegger, um, Erwin Laszlo, systems theory, and also the Buddhist theory of um, dependent origination um, also influences my work here today, so uh, it's fairly broad sweep. Um, I'm extending my theoretical work developed in um, 2009 in contours of ableism, particularly around the concept of relationality, um, causality and progressive change and the, and the nature of social exclusion. Now obviously I can't cover all that today. Um, the grounded aspect of my discussion will be looking at the discipline of law and workplace relations and again looking at how theory can engage with um, uh, real life circumstances. So in part one, I'm going to outline what we mean by ableism, again, not knowing my audience. Some people may have read and be having ableism coming out of both ears, um, or it may be a new area for you. So I, I will be going over some old ground as well as new ground. Um, and then looking at the building blocks of how ableism can help us think through issues of social exclusion. Um, part two is looking at is workplace arrangements and the concept of reasonable adjustment or reasonable accommodation, which is one of the big um, key uh, legal instruments or jurisprudential ideas about how we um, uh, deal with um, workplace barriers. Okay. So I just, by way of summary here, Disability Studies 101. Um, so as you're probably aware, there are, are an assortment of ways to think about and designate disability or bodily difference. Now I use the word corporeal difference because my belief is studies in ableism uh, does not just speak to disability, it speaks to the concept of difference, the concept of ableness, the concept of what is the normative subject. Um, and why I called it ableism a theory of everything, there is always a danger of course about saying well your particular kind of conceptual framework is going to cover a whole lot of other areas and there's kind of pluses and minuses in this area and you only need to see this with the modern trend these days where um, anti-discrimination legislation legislation, the move to get rid of the minority group specific legislation and, you know, consolidate it under some kind of generic um, legislation. But, um, I can, I can. No, you don't need to apologise. Again, I get excited, I speak fast. So, okay. And I'm getting excited over something I probably shouldn't be getting excited about at this stage. So the first model you'd be aware of is the biomedical model. I'm not spending a lot of time on it. It uh, sees the body as a machine, generally, uh, a broken machine that potentially can be fixed or at least transformed. Um, so you've probably heard of cosmetic um, surgery. There is now the new area of cosmetic neurology. So we can all live in hope for this, uh, this area. To the more, the second wave, I guess, is the social model of disability, and again, most of you would be familiar with that. Um, there are many models within that, but I guess 
in a shorthand way. It links um, disability to something to do with the capitalist economy and the way in, uh, and social organisation. So, you know, the model that the disability is produced by uh, way, the way society is organised in some way. Now, that's the very the crude version, but it will do for the moment. Um, we haven't got a whole day on this. Um, the point is the first models, uh, both the first and the second model, have um, disability operates along the lines of what I call a um, linear unidirectional causal paradigm. Now, what do I mean by that? This notion that you can actually find a cause and effect. There's some, there's, there's some source of origin of the problem. You know, and if you can work out what it is, it might be a conception of the body. It might be, in this case, of the social model, the capitalist economy. And then once you work out what the source of the problem is, then it has particular effects and you fix it. Okay. This will become clearer later. For example, the rehabilitation model particularly looks at a cause of a particular problem. It might be a missing limb. It might be a way someone conducts themselves in public. Behaviour modification. Architectural design. Uh, You've spoken about that this morning with the architectural design, um, the economy, or even the adoption of what I call prognosis diagnostics, uh, which uh, talks about uh, predicting disability the, um, in the era now of uh, genetic testing, for example, uh, where that's becoming quite normative to predict risk and um, uh, vulnerability. Um, the third area we model is the relational cultural model, which I want to talk about, about a little bit, which sees disability in terms of an evolution. In other words, um, disability is formed between the interaction of the impairment and the environment, the person themselves, and people's relationship with other people. So the relational model, for example, and again, for people who know about this, is, it's drawn, I put it drawn from the French view, but I must say the French view of disability, but uh, this model also came out of um, a number of Scandinavian countries as well. And it understands uh, the formation of disability as, as relational and intersubjective. So it's, not, it's also about how one, uh, one's own sense of self, how one's own subjectivity is shaped and formed by relationships with other people and one's own relationship with oneself as well. I think there's an internal dynamic. And I love this quote here. It's, um, I've translated it, but it's from the French. Disability as a confrontation between, and I love the word confrontation because it really has that movement of struggle, between the ability of a person and situations she encounters in life macro situations, such as work or schooling, or micro situations such as uh, cutting meat or using the keyboard um, of a computer, or I should say the key to the toilet door. Um, the disabling situations are not only structural and material, they are also um, especially cultural as well. I mean, I must say my um, coming here was always an interesting um, experience of dealing with airlines who, um, who, who take your chair away from you and then kind of wonder what to do next, you know, so different kind of cultural practices about whether you should help yourself. Uh, this perspective is really important, the, um, the uh, in relational cultural perspective, because it doesn't just focus on abilities and limitations, it does look at um, the shaping and forming of the person in society um, and the person's own perception of their difference. Okay. Um, the third configuration, so the cultural model, is reflected in the preamble and the convention of the rights of disabled persons. And I always get excited when I teach this to my law students because I reckon this is one of the most subversive conventions around, if it was let, let air to breathe into it. And what I love about this um, um, convention is the preamble, and there's debates among lawyers. Have we got any lawyers in the room? Um, there's debates about um, lawyers whether, in fact, a preamble forms the active part of the law. But this preamble is really juicy. It's really sneaky. Because if you've read the convention, the convention, look, it's great, but it's fairly, it's the usual kind of thing, you know. But in this convention is this really subversive definition. And I thought, how did this get in? I mean, the wrangling. You know, you see what goes on in the UN, the wrangling that went on to get this convention right. Let's have a look at it. It's there, and it often barely gets a mention in the literature. So it's the preamble. It says disability is an evolving concept. How extraordinary. That disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hidden, hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. 
So I think that is really, really significant, this kind of notion of change, of fluidity, of a lack of fixedness. This goes against, in many ways, uh, the other kinds of norms, World Health Organisation norms, which is about classification crazy. If you're not in the book, whether it be the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or an ICD-10, International Classification of Diseases, you effectively don't exist. You know? You should, every part of your body is coded and measured. So you can go, like you can go to McDonald's all around the world, you can, disability, doesn't matter what culture, what context, you have a code. What's your code, what's your number, what's your barcode? Um, so this is extraordinary. In the middle of all this is this real subversive thing. Now I don't want to overplay it because it hasn't, um, it's, it's, I've been surprised, it hasn't really been noticed much in the literature. Anyway, I'm raving on a bit here and Luke will start uh, jabbing me in the side in a minute. Um, okay, so the fourth way then, and um, the work that I'm doing is a relational concept, but I guess what we call the fourth wave is extended by what we call studies in ableism. And some people are starting to use this as an area. Um, and look, it's, it's kind of an extension. I mean, there's some debates about whether it's separate from the relational cultural model or not, but let's have a look at it. Um, it, it I guess it goes beyond disability, that's the difference. So this model, um, this approach insists that all corporeal, all bodily, all mental relations, uh, you know, uh, whether it be human and non-human, so if we need to look at the way in which um, difference and deviancy and deformity is treated in the animal world. Um, Sonyata Taylor, or Sonny Taylor you may know, is an American academic who's um, doing some very interesting work about ableism and animals, and uh, there's been some very inter interesting intersections between animal rights and ableism and the word speciesism, for example. Um, but also looking at the issue, a, a relationship between objects and nature as well. Um, design, how we design technologies, um, and actually, uh, studies in ableism says that all these aspects, whether they're human, non-human, animate or inanimate objects, are produced within a matrix of causal relations. Now, the words are intentional, so this kind of notion of this circulating network of change, which makes it all the more difficult. Um, and, uh, but there, is, there are relations of causality here. Okay, let's move through. So I'm just going to quickly v go through because I don't want to lose time on this. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is oh you've moved my definition up there. Okay. We've jumped to PowerPoint. Yep. Okay. Yep. I can just very briefly do that one. Okay. So um, what's meant by the concept of ableism? So one of the things I now do with my own students is if they mention ableism in their essays, they need to tell me what they mean by it. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, I think uh, it is used differently. I've surveyed the literature, and in my paper there's a um, list of references about ableism's use, so that might be something that's useful for you. Um, there is, there are, there are, there's limited definitions and conflicting definitions. One of the earliest I put up in, um, uh, is from uh, Russia and McClintock in 1997. Um, you can see the definition up there, but it's interesting. It talks about what's the source of the problem, um, deeply rooted beliefs about health, productivity and beauty. Interestingly, who are the, where, where is this coming from? Perpetuated by public and private media. I thought that was really interesting. Um, 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 combined to create an environment. So it's still a very unidirectional model. It's basically saying these are the sites. If we, and a very simplistic model. Um, in, um, 2001, my, the work of um, Carson, who wrote on feeble-mindedness feeble -mindedness and women, so actually didn't necessarily look at disability per se, and myself started using ableism in a different, um, in a different context, and I started looking at ableism's application to other devalued groups. I think the important thing that I am really certain about after doing this for over a decade is that you, know, you think you can grab onto ableism and then it kind of goes through your fingers. We know it's deeply seated at the level of epistemological systems of life, life systems about what lives are livable. Uh, extraordinary notions of perfection, capacity, productivity, um, pollution, purity, I could go on and on. Uh, per personhood. So ableism is not just a matter of ignorance or, me or negative attitudes. I don't know whether you have this in Germany, but in Australia we have these happy days. 
um, once a year, disability days, and uh, I call them happy days. And um, this kind of notion, if we'd be nice to disabled people that day, and if people keep smiling to disabled people, everything will kind of change. Uh, we also have another one called Harmony Day, which is our intercultural day. That's the one day that we have. Um, I think we have food from different countries. That's our intercultural day. Um, so I think there is, governments often think it's just about, you know, happy, 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 and the more smiling disabled faces on things, um, everything will be, be nice. Um, but um, in fact, you know, ableism is a tra trajectory of perfection. It's a deep way of thinking about bodies. It's a deep way of thinking about wholeness. And these are really important, particularly where religious systems come into place. Um, uh, my own work has been around uh, Christianity and uh, Judaism and uh, Buddhism, and each of these systems has particular notions of wholeness and sanctity and uh, perfection and spirituality. So these, these things come into play. Um, it also has no notions of permeability, the notion of change, how we understand the human body, what is health, what is not health, what is de 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 decline, what is decay. Okay, ableism, uh, uh, it does inaugurate a norm. It's a norm that's there, either something we aspire to, it's something that I aspired to this morning when I looked in the mirror and thought, holy crap, I'm looking really worn out in my face. I need to put some foundation on, otherwise you people think I'm 10 years older than what I am. Um, so we all live it and breathe it, breathe it, and that's the, that's the issue. I think nobody escapes this and we all struggle with this. Okay. So I've put up a definition up here. You can put up my definition now. That's okay. So this, uh, you know, this is the problem about when you write things, that you stuck with them. So in, in 2001, which seems like a long time ago, because it was, I, I did put a definition together. I must say it's not bad, because at the time I was having a stab at something, and I, and I really wanted to look at, again, not looking for trying to, say, identify who the enemy was out there. Or a simple thing that it, um, because I come from an activist background, that this division between able-bodied and disabled, okay? So it was a network of beliefs. They've changed over time. Beliefs, processes, something's going on here, and I'm going to talk about processes, um, and practices that produce a particular kind of self and a body. So there's, there's a corporeal, it's a corporeal standard, okay? And this is changing. We are living in the era where, to quote um, McGee, who is a bioethicist, and he said it's rather crudely, he said, um, today's normals will become tomorrow's abnormals. So we're in this uh, a changing notion where we now have brain uploading chips. We have, um, you know, smart drugs. We have um, uh, all sorts of prosthetics that are out there that are, um, you know, and um, corporeal enhancement. So lots of changes there. Okay. Um, so projected as the perfect species typical, what does it mean to be species typical? One thing we know from anthropology is cross culture, cross cultures, people use their minds and their bodies and their sensing capacities differently. And uh, it raises some interesting issues about the colonisation, the cultural colonisation of the species typical body. Okay, so this is another area. And disability, I said, is then cast off as a diminished state of being human. I noticed I didn't put animals in there. And then I think, uh, actually, when I was thinking about it at the time, we know that scientific racism has, 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 um, in history has performed this role. We know that Aristotle talked about women as being the original mutilated male. Um, uh, you know, Today I wanted to add, I, so I thought, well, what do I need to add to this definition? Um, and what I, I just wanted to be more firm about this, that, the, that, a, that there is an ableist notion of the body, and the body is immutable. In other words, you can, you can spot the disabled body, you can map it, okay? This notion that you can discover and contain the disabled body. This person is disabled. And, um, if you haven't read it already, one of the really good books, I don't know if it's in German, but it's in English, it's old, by Cutchins and Kirk. It's called the DSM Bible on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder. It says, you know, since that manual was in, it went from being 50 pages to 500 pages. What the hell is going on? So we've got this kind of mapping, mapping, mapping stuff happening. See, I'm sorry I'm getting excited again. Um, so it's immutable. Also, this notion of permanent. 
that it doesn't change. That this uh, and late and um, and and, and this no there's this qualities of perfection or enhancement imperative. So if this notion that we should be aiming towards in um, perfection, uh, if not in this life, maybe the next life. Um, and towards this notion of improvability, and you find this in the developmental model that looks nice and in the 1980s when I was in the disability field, that was very radical because we went from the view that disabled people couldn't change. No hope. I started off my life in a sheltered workshop. I don't know if you've had them in Germany. Sheltered employment, yeah? Well, I started off, um, in 1981, I earned 50 cents a day putting lids on bottles and knives and forks in airline bags, back in the days when you had real knives and forks, yeah? Um, and that's because the assumption was that there's not much we can do with your sort of person, you know? So we have the developmental model, which was radical at the time that assumed that you know, disabled people were um, capable of, ch of change and improvement. But there is an ugly edge to this improvability thing too, this kind of notion then that people with disabilities should be striving for perfection or striving to mitigate, and in English the word for mitigate comes from the Latin word smooth over, to dampen down, to tame their impairment. Okay, let's move through. I'm probably going too slow. I need to move through. Thank you. Okay. So a couple of things I want to say here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You can read that on the board. What are the other features here? And I'm going to go through the relationships here. One thing that we can say with ableism is that um, disability is seen as inherently in negative. Now, I've said that in my earlier work. I do want to emphasise it. Inherently negative. In the sense that if disability could be cured or ameliorated, it should be. Okay, and another number of bioethicists have done on work on this. Um, and it gets into some very interesting areas, which I'm not going to go into today, about the scaling and ranking of disability types. Um, some very interesting kind of debates that are there. Um, studies in ableism is useful because we can look at how the abled or abled-bodied, non-disabled identity is maintained. And in fact, I would say these days, not so much able-bodiedness, but look at the concept of abledness. It's the opposite of useless eaters. Okay, so the notion of being abled um, and unencumbered, I'll come back to that later. What, and what does this mean for citizenship? Because this also, I think, has a lot to contribute to issues around immigration and racism and capacity and contribution. Okay, I'm going to uh, move now to the next slide there, actually. We're just gonna skip through here. I just wanted to put this up. Isn't this scary? But it's exciting. This is a really exciting list. Now, I, I just wanted to pull out things. This is, I had to do a, um, a recent article for social work students, um, actually using ableism for non-discrimination practice. So that was the first sign. It wasn't a disability paper. And I was interested to know all the areas that ableism, and I didn't pick up everything. But um, actually, my work, for, for some reason, and you may know yourself because I couldn't read it, my work has been quoted in German computer studies. Go figure. No idea. Nothing to do with disability has been picked up in German computer studies. Um, political theory, violence, nanotechnology and transhumanism, as you can see, a range of areas. Whiteness and racism studies, it's now being picked up as in an area. Sport, of course, law. Okay, let's move through. Okay. Um, so part of the thing, what I want to look at here, now which you've got to slide nine, how are we going in time? How far behind them? Okay, okay. So part of what I'm looking at here is, well, what can um, uh, ableism help us um, sort through? What are the kinds of questions? How can it help us look at policy interventions and the notion of risk? Um, and also looking at what, the, what does the state of disability and non-disability denote? And I'm going to move through to this building blocks here. Now, this is going to be hard, so hold your breath a little bit. We will get through this. Okay. So one of the things when I was thinking about ableism, what, what do we mean by it? There's two elements, okay? One is the element of, you actually go to the next slide there, mm -hmm. Luca. Okay, the first element is the concept of the normal, or the normative, or Rosemary Garland Thompson uses the word normate. I don't know if it does anything for me, but it's there. Okay, the idea of the normal citizen. Now the interesting thing about this is able-bodiedness is always relational. 
There's not, it, it's actually, you can work out who is disabled, but it's very hard to work out what able-bodiedness means. It always has to be looked into what is its opposite. And in fact, one thing that we can say about ableist relations is they're based on an ontology of negation. You know, what, what, are, what are you not? What are you con it's more than differentiation. It's a, it's a negation, it's a turning away, it's a disavowal. Ableism is married to a sense of permanency of the ideal human form. In other words, humans stay in that perpetual fountain of youth. And we know what those issues there to do with elder abuse, etc. Um, the notion of the norm we know is constantly sliding, and I've mentioned about the growing pool of potentially abnormal persons. Maybe you're an abnormal person. If you're not, don't get sit there too secure. Um, with limited resources, if you cannot improve yourself, you may lapse into deficiency. The other area is a constitutional divide. Now, this is the bit that gets a bit tricky. Don't blame me. Blame Bruno, Bruno Latour and the way the French use the word constitutionalism. But, you know, constitutions are important. I had to think about this today, because constitutions, um, maybe we can, go, is it on there? We've got a thing on? Yeah, yep, okay. So constitutions, what are they? They're important because they, they are related to structures, entities which shape a characterisation. They tell us how things are ordered, constitutions. They're rules, how we make sense of things. Um, they're to do with boundaries between persons. Boundaries between children, adults. What age do you become an age person in Germany? Could someone tell me? 18. 18. What about aged? 80. 80. 80. Old. Old. Well, even that is interesting. So, age, you're talking about legal age. Yeah, that's okay. So, what, so when you become an old folk, well, I think seniors is the politically correct term. 65. Yes, there's big pushes there. And it's interesting. So, in some programs, it's 55. Uh, one of my students recently told me uh, 30. <laughs> and you know what I said to him? I said, where is your shovel, your spade, your spade? He said to me, why? I said, start digging your grave. <laughs> but um, so, so boundaries between persons and things, um, who has competency and actions, how we understand actions, and the ways these e um, elements assemble. Constitutions are important. They establish a roadmap, a terrain, the ground rules for governance, Okay, how governments make sense in processes and how we understand things to be right, right relationships. This is how society should be ordered. Okay, um, so there's a constitutional divide between the normal and the pathological. And at the level of ontology, our very sense of beingness, materiality and even sentiency, whether someone is human or not human. And these are huge bioethical debates. Let's move on to the next thing. Yeah, what slide's that? 15? Okay, 14. Okay. So, constitutions require people to, ad um, to um, identify with a category. Can I say to you, if you haven't got a diagnostic category, what I call a numerative passport, you're in deep shit. You have to have a diagnosis. Without a diagnosis, you can't get access to services. You are required when you tick any box to identify with a category. Are you disabled or not? No, I'm not disabled. I'm ill or depressed. I'm able-bodied. These day, racial profiling, religious profiling. I recently went back to my home country, Sri Lanka, to get access to a temple, and um, they looked at me, and the, this, the police officers looked at me and kind of said, well, she doesn't look Sri Lankan. And then the next test was, could I speak the language? And then, they, and then eventually, actually this is quite a funny story, eventually um, there was an accessible entrance but they said I couldn't go into it because they'd been, uh, they were worried about terrorism and I thought, hmm, white terrorists in wheelchairs, new look. So, you know, so profiling happens, maybe that is an issue, maybe that's the new form of modern um, technology of terrorism, I don't know. But um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, I'll leave it up to you to discuss. Um, Bruno Latour said, but however, you know, we know that these categories, these constitutional um, divides exist, but they have to remain separate. Okay? So it, the point is, the way things work is we've got able and disabled. Um, the way this system works is any slippery areas where it's unclear about where people function, that's when they get into trouble. Okay? Sometimes they're not even actually able to get disability coverage um, you know, or it throws people. Like, I can get out of my wheelchair and that becomes a very interesting discussion about whether I've had a miraculous uh, religious experience or otherwise. Okay, let's move through. 
Okay. The other area that um, we talk about, and you can read this in my book, is the notion of purification. And again, that is that notion that we need to have a, po a good population has to be one that's known and counted. And classification is really important, even though it distorts the reality of people with disabilities. And ableism also in terms of racial classifications, where people say, what category do I fit into? I have a Scottish father. I have a Sri Lankan mother. I am Buddhist. I'm from a Jewish background. I was born in Australia. What the hell? People say you're a working, walking diversity model. I say I'm not walking. Sorry. But you know, these kind of categories are slippery categories of what are you, where do you fit. Um, we know, in fact, that most people actually move at different stages in their lives um, through different kinds of categories. Um, I'm also a gay person, and in terms of universal issues around marriage, um, my Marriage in Canada was recognised when I go back home, it's not. So I go through different stages of being married in one jurisdiction, not married in another, being de facto in another jurisdiction. So these kind of um, purification models are important. Okay, I'm moving through. So here's just a little model up here. You can have study it. Sometimes models work for people. You can see you've got these zones here of purification. Disability anomaly, you can put race there. You can put women. You can put... Um, Displaced persons, this, you know, all sorts of things, and then you've got the real people, able-bodied, able mentality, and you've got this other, other net hybrid network, which is actually most of us in this kind of more free-floating category. Let's move through. Okay, stage two. Now let's move through to stage two. Okay, how are we going? Have I caught up? Keep going. Right, God. Okay. Thank God I've got the timekeeper here. He said, I'm going to do this to give it to um, So this is the new stuff. This has never been shown before, and there's a real risk because I could look like a stupid idiot. Okay. But I'm prepared to... This is about thinking through things. So recently, and this is why you should read broadly, recently I was uh, returned to um, an area that's been around for a long time, general systems theory. Some of you might be familiar with this. There's theories. And also... Um, from my own work on the Buddhist doctrine of um, dependent origination, and it's quite an interesting area. So let's have a look through this, and I wanted to test this out. Okay, so all this stuff isn't pie in the sky abstract. We have to test our theories. So um, let's look at the... Pro I was interested, well, how does the processes, how did ableism actually work in daily life? Because we need to be able to know how to pick at it and pick away at it and have change. So, firstly, it's based on this notion of uh, a relational understanding of the two theories, okay? All elements, this notion of, are part of social systems, all elements are part of a vast network of being. And it's um, based on the work of Laszlo, who develops the concept of what he calls interdetermination, to express the elusiveness and changeability of life systems. And I think that's why ableism's hard. It's not like Marxism, where you can sit there and say, here's bogeyman one and here's the victim. You know, is, um, and I was raised within those, those models. I'm a you know, student of that era. Um, it is changing and it's very hard to work out what is going on. Okay, according to the universe here is described as an interdetermined network of mutually qualifying causes and effects where each causal action is reciprocally transmogrified by the effects it produced. You see, causes and effects, different causes, different conditions produce different causes and have different effects, but it depends on how other roles and relationships come into. I think interdetermination, when you think about it, and this is where you need to sit there with your coffee or Chardonnay when you read my paper later, interdetermination, I think, is a useful binder for the study of ableist relations. It can help us in plotting in other words, mapping and diagnosing those elusive relations of perfection and aberration, where they work. Okay. Um, in this system, it's not, po it's not possible to escape the system. I think we have to get, out, get away from this thing of overthrowing ableism. I don't believe it's possible. Um, but we do have the capacity to continually refuse and resist and shape and provide counter codes that modify the ableist environment. Now, can I tell you if this is possible? My job in the law school in 2009 was frightening. For me and for my people, I went to a new school. I was the most senior person with a visible disability. Uh, most of the people I worked with had never met a disabled person, let alone a disabled person wearing a suit. Now, in our environment, it was totally confronting, and uh, that's unusual. And also, in law school, very male-dominated, so it was very unusual. 
Um, some of you might have seen Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, that lovely uh, movie about racism. And it was like that. People initially were very disconcerted. Over that six months period of people initially or literally not knowing what to say or do, the, ch the codes can change and um, disability in terms of awareness generally um, has reshaped the environment. One of the other things I was thinking back also as I've been mulling over ableism, because part of my work is this is dense complex theory, but how do we make it simple without watering it down? And uh, I do a lot of work with um, grassroots people in factories, so, ha so this is my commitment to try and do both. And I was thinking, well, ha how can we summarise these systems? So I've got some words here, and they're working for me, and they're working for other people. Are they up there? Yes, they are. Good. Differentiation. Ableism involves differentiating, saying this is this, this is that, and this is how they're different from each other. Okay? It is a system. It ranks them. Always involves evaluative ranking. The scores. Okay? And we see this, we see this with immigration, how different values, you know. I see this with my partner who has to do two years of paperwork to come here for a week, whereas I have an EU passport and I've never been here before, and I can just kind of go, here's my paper. You know, what's the difference? Country of origin, citizenship. Negation is a system of, uh, that's also important. It's about superiority, where it be anthropomorphism that says this is how we are different from animals. Cultural superiority systems. Um, notification, I put that up because you always need a notice. That's John Law's doing. You know, you need a notice. It's a law saying you're this, you're that. Um, it's a notice saying, uh, you know, uh, in Sri Lanka they give notices saying if this building is, is inaccessible, you will get a fine. The problem is no one ever follows it up. You know, there's lots of laws there, but no one does anything. I understand you're not allowed to walk around with bottles in Germany, someone told me today, of alcohol, but I've seen lots of people walking around with bottles on the street with beer and things. So, and no notification is important. Um, um, I should say to you, I've noticed lots of green gra gra uh, glass on the ground too. This is something when you're in a wheelchair. Next time when you're walking around, look at all the, um, the glass. Uh, so notification is important. Have you, uh, uh, as Foucault once said, are your papers in order? You've got to have your papers. Um, Prioritisation. In some countries in the world, I don't know about Germany, you know, there is a queue for housing depending upon which minority group you're part of. There's a queue for transplantation of organs. Uh, some people in Australia with Down syndrome uh, can't get access to kidney transplantations. So there is a prioritisation system. We know with refugees and displaced persons there is prioritisation. Okay, let's move through. Now, haha. -ha. Actually, can we just go back one thing? This is my. Okay, just one. Okay, this, this is the first time, and listen, I failed remedial maths. You know what remedial maths is? It's the, the worst maths class. I failed it. And someone said to me, my God, you've got a PhD. I said, you can't be good at everything. You know, so this, so this code thing. So system theory says, this is how the network's formed, okay? We have an environment. This is our environment. E is the word environment. How is environment formed? By this notion of what they call percepts. Why don't they have a simple word? Basically, it's ideas. I had to go and look up that word, folks, so you're not alone. This idea of ideas, how we, you know, how we interpret the environment. So hermeneutics means interpret. Well, how do we interpret it? We interpret it through a system code, okay? Codes of understanding. And, um, and then depending on our systems code, then we respond to the environment. Okay, so I'm going to go through this. This is my little attempt here. Okay, so what I wanted to do with this chart, I thought, is this just crappy abstract theory or does this work? Let's have a look at this. Okay, so I wanted to look at um, the issue of access because I'd recently presented a paper on um, a, a UK case, actually, the price versus the UK, which is an old case, about an um, uppity disabled woman who had a go at a judge and was thrown in jail and the jail was inaccessible and she took the case to the European Court of Human Rights, and you know what they said? They said that it was a case of inhumane treatment and torture. And they said that inaccessible environments amounted to inhumane treatment and torture. Okay? And being the wanky social theorist I am, I thought, ooh, that's a form of onto-violence. It's ontological violence. So I was looking interested in this issue of access, that exclusion is a form of violence. 
So access is not just a disability word. Let's have a look at it. So I wanted to look at the question of access. So the first question in the environment is, is there discrimination and is it unlawful? I mean, what do we mean by access? It's an interesting word. So I looked at, so I looked at P. So it's very small there. It says problematisation of inaccessibility. What do we mean by inaccessibility? It could be the built environment. Who is, who is it for? I mean, in England I understand that women couldn't go to medical school for centuries because apparently there weren't enough toilets or there weren't women's toilets. That was the reason why women were excluded from medical school. You know? um, so those kinds of issues come up. Attitudinal issues, uh, juridical, um, judicial issues and, and how we think through things. So um, even the very thought about is, is accessibility a problem? What is access? What does it mean? Okay. What do we really mean by fully accessible environments? I mean, even in terms of the language issues here, we should be having multiple translations, potentially, if that's important. Uh, there could be a range of things kind of happening. Uh, deck chairs, nice, comfortable tech chairs with massage or something. I don't know. I mean, there's a whole range of things there. We decode the question of access here. So here's the decoder. How do we make sense? Well, here's those words again, differentiation. Who's important? Well, I've been told it's pointless making buildings accessible because no disabled people use them. You were telling me earlier that it was in Finland that they, there's an, um, a move to only make first floor, floor of uh, buildings accessible. Well, that's interesting. Does that mean that disabled people don't jump off buildings or um, uh, we don't use second floors or we, don't need, we haven't got the money to get the, the penthouse views? What does it mean? Um, so this kind of differentiation about you know who's in the list, uh, we can do this with immigration as well. The ranking, the, the, the different visa systems to rank value of contributions, uh, negation notification. I've already been through that. I've also put this kind of subtle area, what I call modalities of discernment. What is seen? What do we notice? What do we don't notice? How many of you here, and I'm assuming most of you are German, have noticed, certainly in the inner city areas, that nearly all your pavements have tiny pieces of green glass? Is this, have you noticed this? Has anyone noticed this? It's everywhere. And I realised that green must have been, is that the colour of beer bottles? Because it's currently dark brown glass, but that's not as popular. <laughs> But it is. It's very interesting. So this kind of what is hidden? Do we notice often in our own environments what is hidden? What uh, you know, just in terms of uh, um, cultural issues, um, what is permissible? What is tolerated? Okay, you're looking down things here. Okay, keep moving on. And I guess depending on our answers here, we're going to move. We're going to look at well, is there social exclusion? There may not be, depending upon um, our understanding of access. And we have a number of responses here. Can we move to the next mm -hmm. slide? And I think those responses are here. So I'm going to go through this. So we have a couple of responses here. We can say, firstly, and I've got up there. Okay, we might ask the question. I've already said, what is access? And, and these relate to our notions of uh, whether people are non-citizens, partial, or full citizens. Okay whether there's lawful or unlawful discrimination. So this works really well. Okay, and I've talked about the codes. Let's look at what our responses might be. So we're moving down to the bottom thing here. We might say there's no social exclusion. Or exclusion, or at least, is arguable. Okay, so you think about apartheid. It was argued and justified. And there's no need for change, because that's how the Bible said it was to be. And that's how we do. And we might, I would be interested to know what the rationale is for the first floor Finnish uh, apartments. Um, we, no, there's no change except for affirming the status quo. In other words, everything's okay. That's how we are. That's how uh, our society works. That's our values. We may have a second response, which is a common one. Responses of, exce of ex exceptionality. We may allow for par parallel approaches or differential access. So um, in Australia, for example, I come from a very, very conservative state and um, uh, sex work was illegal and uh, had been on the street for many years. So um, uh, once the par parliamentarians decided it wasn't going to go away, they then decided they would regulate and licence brothels and have uh, red light districts only. Okay? So you can do that. You can kind of allow things but have exceptional zones like disability parking, that's an interesting one. How many disability parking, you know, I get very annoyed when I go to university. 
very bad for a disability studies scholar because I'm so politically incorrect. I get there at seven o'clock in the morning, that's pretty early, and I get annoyed. Every year there are too many disabled people coming to university. It's of great inconvenience for me because every, who, what student is coming to the university at seven o'clock in the morning? Well, the disability parks are nearly always full. Now, why this will, is on a, on a serious level, this also comes up to a view which I'll talk about in my presentation later, provided I keep moving along, that one of the things about um, ableist relations is it, if it, can, it can continues to tell us a lie. It tells us a lie that disability is a minority issue, that disability is uh, a, a, a um, inherent m minority it's an, a, and it's a marginal issue and in fact there's lots if, if disability was seen as a majoritarian issue of, and, and our understanding of disability um, was 40 percent of the population we wouldn't have these silly quotas that says this is how many cripples turn up in car parks and this is how many mothers are with prams and um, all these kinds of issues so the exceptionality special facilities restricted toilet facilities for women in our university recently, they decided they weren't going to use the word disability because they thought it might have been traumatic. We now have equity toilets. <laughs> I love it. You know, and because I'm really naughty. Seriously, I get fed up. You have to have humour, otherwise you'd cut your throat in this game. Seriously, I keep saying, is there wine? Is there special smelly things in the toilets? You know, what is in this equity toilet? Is it got hot toilet seats? What's in it? You know? So that's what it is, equity toilet. Um, the other response, of course, is a resistant response that um, suggests a need for reform and code changes by way of law reform. Okay, I want to know how far we are behind. Just keep moving. Keep moving, okay. I'm going to move through here. Okay, this is the toughest bit where I went, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, what I'm going to talk about here, and I'm just going to skip through it a little bit, is in Buddhist theory, um, yeah, have you got that definition yeah, up? Yeah. Okay. So there's a notion in Buddhism, for example, that um, everything is changed and everything is moving. Okay. This notion that bodies are changing, but so are causes and effects. And I want to read this definition here, and it's useful for me in terms of looking at how we can look at the um, pinpointing the conditions of ableism and what conditions come into play that creates problems of exclusion. But let's look at this definition here. We're just going to move down to the bottom one, um, and this is by Yin Shen. Um, it's not written for our community, but the belief is that everything mental and physical comes into being owing to certain conditions and disappears when the conditions disappear. So nothing is independent. Reality is viewed as a dynamically interdependent process. Everything exists in a web of mutual causal interaction and nothing, whether mental or physical, whole or part, is immutable or fully autonomous. And this is the good news. A cause can only produce an effect given the right conditions. So it's looking at these conditions. Okay. So what I find what really interesting here is to look at the specific types of conditions. Um, one of the things that we know from Buddhist theory is that um, we can maybe look at what are the conditions that induce ableist relations. How certain conditions produce exclusion. And one of the things that I'm looking at at the moment is looking at the origination of the conditions. So we can break it up, look at its sources. So this gives us food for uh, great research methodologies here for data analysis. How do the processes keep regenerating? Okay, why is it year after year? I mean, I started in university in 1981 as a student. Why is it year after year we keep having to remind people that, of access issues, this generation of issues? How, how, does, how does being emerge? How are, we shaped, how are we shaped and formed by the processes of exclusion and entitlement? Some people are formed by entitlement. How is it nourished? Um, what, how, how, how do conditions act foundationally? Let's move through. Okay, I'm going to skip through a bit here. Okay, let's move through. I just want to put this up here and then we're going to move to workplace relations and we should catch up now. That's good. Okay, so one of the things that I've put up here is um, um, I was looking at um, some of the mechanisms for what I call this ontological violence because ableism involves what we call onto-violence. This, um, this sense of forcing a compulsory sameness. And that happens in citizenship debates, 
you know, the citizenship tests in some countries, the notion of productivity, the notion of ableness. And I was thinking about what are these things that come together? The notion of microaggression and the work of Richard Keller from New York, this notion of, um, and Richard Delgado on racism, for those of you who do racism studies, the day-to-day -day business as usual forms of racism. The stares, the looks, the remarks, the sneers, et cetera, et cetera. It happens in the area of disability as well, where people come up and pat you on the head and do all sorts of things. Um, but also internalised ableism, the things that we, from marginal groups, internalise, the negative views of ourselves, you know, the capacity. I mean, my book was produced in 2009. Um, I could have done it years earlier, but it was this kind of thing of like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Don't know if I'm good enough. Those kind of things, you know. Don't know if I'm good enough. Um, one of the things that we need more research on in the disability community is the high levels of suicide among people with disabilities who are white collar professionals um, with the pressure of the performance pressure, um, the lack of role models. We know work has been done with people of colour of the extra uh, mental health stresses of racism. Okay, the other area I put up there inter intervening is I'm not good at diagrams, it's this notion of encumbrance. We don't talk about breadwinners much in the labour force area anymore, the male breadwinner. Um, this notion of the unencumbered worker, the person who's available 24-7, looks good, snazzy, on time, doing things, who doesn't have um, a family, who doesn't have aged relatives, who doesn't have a disability um, and has someone at home who's going to do their ironing, washing, dishes and every other kind of need. So let's move through. Are we half, half time now, or are we just on half? Just over it? Okay. Okay, so what I want to do now, um, actually, I'm going to move through. Keep moving to, keep going. Let's, okay. I want to move on to workplace relations. Okay, and this is a nice bit now. Your heavy theory's kind of gone. Kind of gone. Okay. So what I was really, uh, this is two areas I've brought together. One is reasonable accommodations, and, um, and uh, you've got Alan here who's going to do a great job um, tomorrow. This is his area, his baby. Um, uh, what I'm interested in, I guess, is just, just looking at um, concepts at work um, in the workforce. So the first thing I want to say to you is don't worry about the word lex crip. Lex is Latin for law and crip, cripple. So I'm interested in the area where law works with people with disabilities. And you know, there's been great work done on, on um, law's construction of the black subject, of the terrorist, of the immigrant, um, gender constructions. You only need to look at women and madness. And I'm looking at law here. So drawing upon Judith Butler's theories of performativity, I argue that through repetition, and courts are full of repetitious acts, it is a performance. Law is definitely a performance. We teach our young lawyers to do a performance. They are storytellers. Okay. Um, Able-bodiedness constantly sets itself up as the ultimate goal to um, strive for. So that becomes the measure of the reasonable man and is the ground of imitation. Um, it is a normative compulsion, but it also uh, raises issues about what is believable in law, what kinds of characters are suspicious, what sorts of testimonies are believable. Okay, uh, notions, for example, legitimacy, fraudulency, the welfare system, which many of you know about, the social protection of sy system, is obsessed with the disabled fraudster. fraudster. I always talk about it, disabled people in drag. You know, this notion that, uh, you know, I, I acknowledge that there are disabled people who commit fraud, but is it a ma majority of disabled people? No. But we also need to get into the area of problematising what we mean by fraudulency tell as well. But this notion of the indeterminacy of the core of causes of action. Um, I, if you're interested in this area in mental health, Michael Perlin, lovely man from the New York Law School. Do I mention him there? I do. He talks about pretextuality. He looks at people with mental health conditions. And he talks about the way courts accept testimonial dishonesty. And in fact, and he's not just an uh, academic, he goes into the courtroom and how um, courts operate on, the view, on views of what he calls sanism. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Sanity. Sanism. This notion about what is an insane or a sane viewpoint. Okay, let's move through. I'm going to move through. Keep next one. Actually, let's go through there. Okay, the other thing is lawyers are symbol traders. Um, you know, if you've been to a lawyer, you know most people have 
a range of stories, not in order, a lot of emotion. And the role of a lawyer is to assemble that story in a meaningful way to use the symbols that are understandable to argue a case. And Laura Rovner, she's done, uh, she hasn't written for a few years, but she's done some fantastic work from the Denver Law School, easy to read for non-lawyers, great work. And she talks about what are the archetypes or what are the, the images that disabled people have to adopt to get into the courtroom, let alone to have a successful case, okay, just to even get a foot through the door. And she talks about, and you know them, the helpless cripple and the cheerful overcomer. As against the victim as manipulators. They're the fraudsters, right? Okay. I want to read these out because they're beautiful. Her language, not mine. Laura Rovner, writing in 2001. The cripple is expected to accept her role of inferiority outside of society. She is assumed to be unable to work and her subsequent failure to produce... Is, 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 is interpreted as proof of her inferiority. She engages in little social activity, bears what is seen as a bleak existence, I hope the violins are coming out, and is socially devalued. Society responds to the cripple with pity, fear, and quite often um, repulsion, although cripples often take on the image of the deserving poor, nor morally blamable for their unfortunate circumstances. So here's an issue of deservingness too. What caused your disability? Most charitable activities to people with disabilities are premised on the notion of the cripple. So what becomes really important in this image is the notion of the disabled person as the sufferer. Now you can suffer discrimination and be pretty pissed off and mad and actually be treated unequally, but you may actually have your act together, or as I say my students rather colloquially, it's good for theorists to be colloquial. You may have your shit together about disability, but, but you may not be sitting there like a doormat, like suffering all the time. But you have to have this, I am suffering. I am falling out of my tree and um, emphasising this. Um, negation is often a strategy that contrasts with victim as manipulators who don't measure up. So we have a derelict class who are characterologically suspect. People who've had impairments caused through drug and alcohol abuse, HIV AIDS, guns, uh, you know, and racialised violence, possibly even neglect and poverty. So we have issues there where disabled people and their families, the relationship between poverty, uh, neglect and disability. Uh, these all jeopardise the good work towards disabled people. In fact, often what happens in the judgments, the courts will often say, you people are making it hard for the genuine disabled people. So we have these two classes of people emerging. Okay. Um, interestingly, um, in, there's an alternative narrative that comes up here called the overcomer. I love it. And we're going to have an overcomer here. I love the overcomer. The overcomer engages in a strategy of what's called disability disavow. What do I mean by that? She literally makes her disability disappear. I'm not disabled. I have needs. This association of disability irrelevance. Okay, and she's a hero because she puts impairment back in place. And sometimes you'll find this in government strategies where they'll say, "See the person, not the disability." You know, um, it's interesting because it can backfire by saying, "See the person, not the gender," like somehow this disembodied thing. You know, and you can understand where the intention comes from. It doesn't quite work at dividing people into compartments. The overcomer spends an inordinate amount of time going in circles, literally performing ableness. She is the super crip, not me, displacing her impairment and engaging, saying, I'm not like those other disabled people. Those of you who have disabilities, particularly mobility impairments, you might know it's an interesting issue where they sit all the disabled people together. It's like, ah, oh, the class there. It's kind of an interesting thing. Sometimes you think it's great and you think, I don't want to sit next to these people. I've got nothing in common with these people. So this kind of thing. Let's look at Rovner again. I like it because the language is juicy and then we're getting through, we're getting fine. The overcomer seeks to minimise the visible symptoms of her disability and exhibits the proper attitude, <coughs> smiling preferably. She learns to deny her disability and frequently disassociates herself from her own disability and other people's disabilities. And here's the ranking. Um, this might be evidenced by foregoing a wheelchair, even if using one would be more efficient. So as I said to you, I can actually stand up and walk, and it's very interesting, uh, some of the issues about legitimacy 
of doing that. Uh, maintaining a general, general wariness of being spotted with individuals with disabilities for fear of being associated with such inferior deviants. I don't blame her. Wolf Wolfensberger told us to do that. Some of you might remember normalisation, social role valorisation theory. His theory of the conservatism corollary talked about many stigmatised people associating with each other would actually magnify the disadvantage. I think he talked about uh, not associated with men wearing caftans, actually. I think it was some stranger's idea. The overcomer is often proud when people regard her as not really disabled. Society applauds her for not giving in to personal constraints for conquering her handicap. Thus, society views her as inspirational, although she's still patronised, pitied and excluded. Okay, so because of these two approaches, the litigant, um, if she wishes to present another image of living impairment, say, such as a positive image, um, he, um, the law makes it impossible for those stories to be told. Okay, let's move. One of the things I talk about in this paper is, um, is the issue of reasonable adjustment in the workplace or reasonable accommodations. Um, it looks like a disability thing, but one of the things I already argue is that employers are already making reasonable accommodations in the workplace. Many workplaces, uh, for many employees, uh, many workplaces are designed to be family free, fr friendly. Many workplaces these days, not all, uh, look at flexible working hours. Uh, sometimes, particularly in a white collar job, before you even start your job, um, um, you know, you're asked about how you want your office laid out, the lighting to be done, um, these kinds of things. Um, you know, um, issues about break times, unionism, for example, well, industrial relations. Uh, so there are situations, for example, where we need to look at who is the benchmark employee. Uh, do we have a, na a narrow construction of, um, of the needs of employees? Who are the customers of the services, um, and who are citizens in general? Okay. Let's move through there. Um, the other aspect of law that comes up, and I just want to briefly talk about this because this has also come up in the literature and in legal cases, are this notion of disabled people whinging. Uh, and what often comes up here is this notion of rights and equality rights and when people with disabilities and people from marginal groups are asking for access to equity, um, because just equality is seen in terms of the concept of sameness, the uh, often special rights are put in place and there's a backlash here. Um, and often what happens in the area of disability, for example, is this notion that disabled people are very self-preoccupied, this notion of disability and narcissism. Now, I was quite shocked about this. I don't come from a psychology background, but you find this come up in the court cases where um, there is this notion of stereotypes and uh, self-obsession. Um, the people with disabilities are opportunists, trying to get as much out of uh, the legal system, out of workplace modifications, uh, malingerers, and I think there's one quote I put up there, looking for a lifelong a buffet of perks and special breaks. Um, I think what's really interesting in a in, um, number of court cases is that uh, court cases truly um, continue to acknowledge, um, continue, sorry, to ignore differences, so the politics of difference and what differences are indeed noticed and uh, what differences are indeed attended to. And the notion then, particularly in disability law, of um, talking about those who are truly handicapped and those who uh, might be disabled but uh, don't are not as deserving. Okay. How much time have I got in total? Fifteen minutes? Ten minutes? Okay. Okay. So, what I want to do now is just talk about reasonable accommodation and reasonable adjustment. What word do you use here? Uh, is it reasonable accommodation, more or less? You know, I don't know what you use in employment law. So this notion then of adjustment or accommodation. So I'll, I'll talk about what it is. So the first thing about reasonable accommodation, the notion is um, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that's based on if you treat disabled people in the workplace the same as other employees. Uh, inequalities and disadvantage can occur. So obviously, uh, I used to have a cartoon at the front of this paper that has a bunch of people, including elephants and fish in bowls and gorillas and whatever, um, asking everybody to jump a certain height. Okay, so if you have the same rules, uh, it's going to affect people differently. So the notion of reasonable adjustment is factoring in people's particular needs. But what's really interesting about it is, um, 
In terms of most social policy and in terms of ableist relations, it, ableist relations are about diminishing difference and accentuating commonness. So whether it be race or gender or sexuality, this notion that we are all the same, aren't we? And also this notion of mitigating, particularly in the area of, um, of uh, disability, mitigating. Um, if you can correct your disability to make it more socially acceptable, if you have Tourette's syndrome, you might want to have some sort of drug that kind of tones down the chatter in public, behaviour modification. Um, sometimes people have uh, ear surgery to correct larger than average ears. Um, all sorts of kind of practices take place uh, to uh, normalise people. Um, as a person of mixed race, when I was growing up in the 1960s, uh, you know, uh, from an Asian background, uh, you know, was really stressed to minimise our cultural differences, to speak English well, to wear white people's clothes, to um, uh, act in a particular way and not draw attention to one's Sri Lankanness, uh, even to have a name like Fiona Campbell, although Kamari is in the in the, bit, in the middle there. So um, why am I saying this? Because reasonable adjustment does the opposite. So this is an unusual strategy. It says, in order to get beyond an individual's disability, this is a judge's language, we first must take account of that disability. There is no other way. In order to treat some persons equally, we must treat them differently. So in fact, usually when you go into hiding, in the workplace, reasonable um, accommodation asks you to actually foreground to actually draw attention to your disability, to out yourself. Now there's all sorts of risks here, particularly with invisible disabilities and some disabilities where you know, warning bells go off like mental illness or uh, multiple sclerosis or something like that. Okay, so um, the commitment to equality as it is based on um, a sameness model, here we've got a difference model. Okay? So we're recognising that people have differences and uh, we need to attend to those differences um, to make individuals uh, more productive. And this is interesting. So we have a flashpoint here and what I'm interested in my research is to look at what goes on in the interaction. Here's our network again between the employer and the employee. Management but also fellow workers. How do we negotiate difference in the workplace? Reasonable adjustment asks us not to disavow our disability but to bring it to attention um, and to claim entitlement, which is a very unfamiliar territory. And particularly for many people with disabilities, it's been trained not to ask, not to say, don't draw attention to your impairment. You know, be grateful for the job. You know? Um, don't draw attention to the fact that you have different dietary needs because of your religion or your cultural beliefs because that could cause problems and we know it causes problems. Here's a different system. Okay, let's move through. I wanted to, um, I've just put up the UN convention there. You can have a look at that. It's got what reasonable adjustment is. You know, it's, 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 it's again necessary and appropriate modification but you've, it's not an open-ended thing disproportionate and undue burden. I mean, there's some very dodgy words there. Would it be, if you use this with any other group about disproportionate undue burden, where do we draw the lines? This is about the issue of, again, access and the systems codes about whether we are fully inclusive or not. Um, I note, and I'm not from the UK, uh, certainly with uh, the um, Equality Act, and again, I can only look at it on paper, I know lots of different things happen in practice, there is an unusual model of reasonable accommodation because it talks about, in one section at least, what they call anticipated reasonable accommodation. So we don't wait for a person with difference, in this case a disabled person, to roll up and just look at their individual needs, I mean, that happens, but we look at what do we need to do to change our environment, at least on paper, uh, as inclusive as possible, to get people to think through these things uh, before people show up. Um, I look forward to Alan's uh, discussions maybe around whether that happens. It's an interesting concept because it actually, it doesn't wait for the person with difference to come through the door. Okay, the interesting thing is, what is a reasonable accommodation, okay? These are percept questions that are decoded by workplace relations systems and there are inbuilt discriminators. 
that concern the reach of tolerability. tolerability. How many changes should we make into the workplace? How many forms of difference should we accommodate in one workplace? Um, are there spaces of exception? Do we bend over backwards? So let's have a look at uh, some of these kind of characteristics. Interestingly, and I'm, I'm, I'm just rushing through here, um, this is a UK um, uh, US survey. Um, interestingly, in this survey, um, most of the accommodations are related to making the facilities accessible um, and related to being flexible with HR policies. So reasonable adjustment requires the employer to take into account the characteristics related to disability and then changing the job. Okay. But the problem about this is um, there are schemes and codes, and I mentioned this before, it runs the risk of what I call the codification of need. In your, if you're in a wheelchair, this is what you could need. Um, these are the systems, these are the classifications, as against looking at what your individual needs might be. Let's move through. Hmm? Okay. What's that page? Okay. So one of the um, issues that comes up here is looking at, uh, when we look at workplace performances, we need to look at what are the conditions in workplaces that make workplaces flourishing or deadening. Okay? One of the, there has been research that looks at recruitment, not just recruitment to the workforce, but retention and career pathways. And again, Alan might talk about that a little bit further. Um, I've got a whole list up here, which we'll go to, about the kind of um, things that come up that make uh, that cause issues. Inflexible work environments, so particularly for people with psychiatric um, illness and episodic illnesses. Lack of knowledge about how reasonable adjustment principles actually operate. And that's a real problem. In my workplace for staff, not so much for students, it's hard to know exactly what is meant by reasonable adjustment in the, in the, in the university, to have the policies. Um, and then you're kind of working out, well, maybe I should be grateful, what can I ask for? you know, what is permissible. I was told recently if they allocated a special car parking spot for me, um, that would mean that I was disadvantaging other staff employees. And I said, but it's different. I need this to be close to the building. I'm in a senior management position. I have to go to four campuses in one day. So these kind of notions. Risk aversion, people often are fearful of losing pensions and benefits um, or to being seen as being unproductive. So hiding illness and absenteeism. Um, failure of disability support services, um, that's often a real issue in workplace relations where people need ongoing support. Disability vilification and harassment in the workplace by co-workers, five minutes have I got? Okay. Um, that's okay. Um, the stress of integration. What uh, we know again from racism, racism studies, what, what happens when you are the only person with a disability in that workplace? Where do you get your role models? Where do you get your sources of support and debriefing? And I must say, in my own case, I mean, I'm fairly savvy. I mean, in my first six months in the law school, of constantly going to meetings where lack of access. Um, uh, being in charge of learning and teaching but not being able to go to the graduation because it was inaccessible, these kinds of issues. Um, it really is, you have what we call in English a bad hair day. It's very, very depressing and quite debilitating in many ways. Um, ad additional communication hurdles for culturally and linguistically diverse people and dis double discrimination for women with disabilities. Okay, and employees, employers, there are also issues about where they can get assistance. Um, in Australia, I don't know whether it's the case in Germany, about people with disabilities being seen as occupational health and safety burdens. In fact, what we've actually found in the Australian research is that uh, um, disabled people have one of the lowest rates of workplace injuries. So there's some examples there of the kinds of effects there. Um, I want to move on here. Okay, so system four, I mean, figure four, really is about um, the fact, this notion of what's driving workplace relationships, special measures and favours, notions of fairness. One thing we know from the research that's been done in the employment area is relationships with co-workers are absolutely uh, imperative in making um, uh, workplace safes vibrant. So here's the systems here, the causal relations. A person may be employed, but if co-workers are also ignorant and hostile, um, this can totally create um, a ricocheting effect uh, of very deadly workplace relations. Okay, next we'll move to this next slide. Okay, so on some of the slides here, I've only got a couple more to go through and then we're pretty much done. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, what are the other strategies that I've looked at here? Um, the office can be a minefield of able relations where the dramas of internalised ableism are fought out. So the notion of entitlement, who is entitled to what? Um, disavow, people bringing attention their difference, how we negotiate difference. Anti-violence, we know the work of Margaret Vickers on bullying in the workplace of people with disabilities. If you're not familiar, her work on people with MS, brilliant international scholar on bullying. The politics of envy and gratitude are played out. So we, are getting, we get some people with disabilities who are so desperate for work that they have subjected themselves to working conditions that border on abuse and slavery. What have we looked at here? Well, the impairment effects. I've looked at a couple of strategies here in this diagram. Concealing disability in order to dampen the effects. Emotions management, always putting on the happy face, maybe providing people with information. Requesting help, sometimes some people do that to clarify behaviours, constantly explaining why you do things. Um, when I go to workplaces, the first thing I say is, hello, my name is Fiona Campbell, and by the way, I want you to know I can get out of the wheelchair and walk, it's because I've had people faint, uh, literally, uh, and just for them. So it's a very strange thing to introduce yourself by, but you pretty almost have to get it out of the way. Um, the exceptional employee becoming a super worker to dispel myths. Okay. I've talked about internalised ableism. I might just move to... I'm running out a little bit of time here. Keep moving through the slides. Okay. So I just want to uh, spend the last few minutes talking about the issue of uh, the reasonableness of disability. Okay. And ableist relations. I've got five minutes. Okay. Okay. So one of the things about workplace relations when I've been talking about ableism is the paradigm of reasonableness in itself um, uh, int introduces a normative quantum into the discussion. It raises questions about the nature of asking for help and the ramifications of, of, of bringing to attention, foregrounding the impairment effect. Um, reasonable adjustment creates certain questions and which ableist norms circulate. In other words, when you are working with an employer, you often ask, what have you, been, what have you done to minimise your impairment? And is it enough? What strategies have you taken to, to deal with your disability? What can the employer do for me? Is it reasonable to trump human rights so that employers can consider what they find unreasonable about disability laws in general? Now, this is interesting. One of my um, sister universities, not ours, the law school itself tried to lead amendments to the Disability Discrimination Act because they didn't want to make reasonable accommodations for um, disabled students undertaking law. So this is a kind of an interesting area. We have a very famous case, and you can read it um, in the US, the Van der Zee case, a lovely case, where a woman wanted a kitchen sink modified. She wanted it raised an inch and a half because she was in a wheelchair, okay? It was going to cost 150 US dollars. I want to spend a little bit of time on this in my five minutes Australian time. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, so she wanted the sink lowered. Why? Because unlike the rest of the staff when they washed their, their teacups, she was told she had to go and use the toilet. And she felt that that was hum un not just unhygienic, humiliating. And this, uh, she wanted it raised an, uh, an inch and a half $150, so we're not causing, talking about lots of money here. And the court actually said that, uh, that they, that, that, that they um, and in fact it was ju uh, Justice um, Posner, some of you might know Richard Posner, who's also a legal philosopher, who's talked about um, we should have a bending over backwards test. So I don't know how that translates in German, but this notion that we've, we've done enough for you and is this too much, okay? He talked about the fact that this woman was whinging that this was a trivial improvement in the life of a disabled person. So here we have is the trivialisation of the experience. Well, she's using the sink as against the toilet was not trivial to this woman. She said she felt humiliated, dehumanised, let alone the hygiene issues here. But here we have a case here uh, of where we talk about the trivialisation of the disability experience. Okay. I just want to, go, I want to go to my last slide here, and I've cut a lot of things out of here, and I really do thank you for bearing with me. The first thing I want to say to you in my last slide is, um, 
I think one of the things about this is disabled people are an afterthought. And I think actually non-normative uh, people, people of colour, uh, people from um, outside our society um, are often seen as an afterthought. I think with disability in particular, one of the problems is we are a significant portion of the multitude, between 20 and 40 per cent. And yet our, our existence is driven down by a process of actuarial reductionism. Under the American with Disabilities Act, we are called a discrete and insular population, 13 per cent. That means we are exceptional rather than usual. And for as long as we're seen as exceptional in a spirit of ableism, uh, you know, or we will be excluded or there will be exceptional practices put in place. There will be Band-Aid solutions. Um, one thing I want to finish with this paper is I talk about the notion of disability being as a, st a state of ambivalence because the experience of disability actually uh, in many ways actually confronts us with the notion of the changing body and the changing human condition. If we want to transgress and to challenge ableism, we don't have to be exceptional. We can actually do this in the day-to-day -day encounters of, or of orderliness um, and resistance. Um, what I've tried to do in this paper is to look at ableist relations, and I've skipped over huge bits like the hospitality, but to talk about ableist relations as a system of causal relations and to make links for us as researchers to make links in identifying the conditions and the problems and effects of ableism, and in which case we are then able to develop points in which we are able to intervene and hopefully transform some of the ableist systems codes and to rethink accessibility for all. Thank you. As I said, I have a full copy of the paper plus the PowerPoints and um, ma maybe you can make them available through the conference. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Uh, we are about to have a break in about uh, 10 minutes' time. And I'm told Um, we've got 10 minutes for a couple of questions. If you're really dehydrated, obviously, yeah. don't get a drink of water. But we've got about 10 minutes for questions and comments. And we've got a microphone here. I can give it to the one who wants to ask some questions. Hello. Um, I found it really, really interesting, your talk, so thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to ask you your thoughts on the, something you said right near the end about disabled people being an afterthought, because actually now, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the UK, I would say that's changed mm. quite dramatically. And it's gone in the last year, perhaps, from disabled people rarely being mentioned in the media at all, to now being mentioned all the time as yeah. the scapegoat and the cause of... Yeah all the economic problems that yeah. we've got. Yeah. Well, not including migrants as well. They're the other cause of yeah. it. Um, well, I think there's two things there. One is, I mean, um, one area one would want to look at is the after, what, what we mean by an afterthought. So that could be initially a, a, an absence or omission. But I think uh, um, the other thing that's happening there, as you say, is this kind of scapegoating and the de demonising of the other. So I think um, I'd be really interested to see how disability in fact is, is put into that relationship so I think it's uh, you say the demonizing that's there it also potentially if we look at the experience of race um, can kind of backfire and show the limits of anti-discrimination law for example there was a case in the United States and I can't remember the name of it but um, it was a race discrimination case and um, it t um, in in one state dis uh, people of colour were seen as a protected class and that was based on the history of racial discrimination. Okay? So it was recognising the fact that uh, particular special measures had to be put in place for uh, people of colour. Um, the judge in this case had said that um, because African Americans had uh, made tremendous economic and political advancement that they no longer were able to um, 
get those special measures and then had to be treated as part of the reg regular population. So this stuff, I think, uh, has strange twists and turns. I think what you have here in the case is you're getting um, a visibility, but at the same time, it's not a necessarily a normalising visibility. It's a it's a demonising visibility. Uh, it's another form of scapegoating that's uh, that's always been there, but it's coming in a a different way. Um, so I'd be really interested. Um, part of my work and my, what my new book's going to be looking at, I'm very interested in this issue of absence and presence. You know, because actually my view is, in fact, actually disabled people um, often aren't, in, aren't excluded in society. It's the issue of what is noticed, what is seen, and what is perceived. So um, yeah, I'd be really interested in having a conversation further with you about that. talked about ableism as a system um, and how do you think about the relation between for example racism and ableism it's like the racist ranking as a part of the system ableism or different yeah. systems or how do you get it together you know I've been um, over the last 12 years I've it's been a very uh, hesitant conversation I mean my own work um, is in disability studies, but I also uh, do work in post-colonial theory and um, I'm very interested in racism studies. I, um, so I hold those two together. When I get sick of disability stuff, I go back to the other area. Um, and my work, in fact, one of my earliest published works was the looking at how critical race theory, um, how we can learn from the experiences of racism and theorising racism, how it can help us rethink disability. So I think, um, um, there are some interesting relationships there. I'm also mindful of grand theories trying to run over the top of um, other ways of configuring difference. My, my view is, and I am within all those hesitancies, hesitancies and fears of um, uh, erasing difference, because I think governments love doing this, and I've talked about sometimes with anti-discrimination legislation now being it's, it's not uh, focusing on specific issues or specific kinds of people, it's more generic. At the same time, I see some interesting, and uh, not just myself, other people, um, interesting similarities, you know, whether it be the freak shows for disabled people in the 1800s, the kind of um, uh, collections between phrenology and scientific racism that's searched for, um, you know, anatomical differences between classes of people and um, IQ tests, intelligent quotient tests. Um, I think in many ways there are different inflections, even with sexism, for example. Uh, interesting, I've, some of my work has looked at the issue of whether pregnancy should be classified as a disability under disability legislation, and there's been some really interesting work around there, and some of the responses uh, is no regret, for example, that um, the women in the final trimester of their pregnancy often, some women, have tremendous mobility issues um, and need accommodations. Um, yet pregnancy is a normal part of existence and often there is a hostility towards using disability accommodations uh, on the basis that disability is seen as an abnormal part of existence. See, this is where we start getting into these kinds of issues. Um, so I think, uh, I think generally at this stage, certainly the people I've been working with is often we will use ra racism and ableism. I think we need to continue the conversations, which is why I think this conference is really good. I think there's some common points of uh, convergence. Um, I think there are some very specific departure points. But I think also if you look at racism, racism is experienced differently and in different ways and has gone through <coughs> different processes too deport depending on its context and its conditions. Thank you. We've got time for one quick question or comment. Anyone? Involves doctoring some of your minds. Yeah. Can we thank Fiona again thank you. for a brilliant